We are living in extraordinary and unsettling times. Only a week ago, we were together in church, and the children headed off to school on Monday morning, as usual. Today, apparently for the first time in 800 years, there is no public worship taking place in the Church of England. Our schools are effectively closed. Public exams have been cancelled for the first time since their introduction in 1888. Sport has been put on hold. The pubs are closed. Businesses are struggling. Many are fearful for their own health, their jobs, their older or ailing relatives. We are in the midst of a national, indeed a global, crisis. It seems destined to become one of those era-defining moments like 9-11 or the murder of JFK. As the Prime Minister puts us on a war footing, some of you will remember from your childhood what it was like to be at war. And there is some perspective in that, isn't there? No one is bombing us, and there is plenty of food for all. The vast majority of us will get COVID-19, but will make a full recovery. Nevertheless, in these extraordinary and unsettling times, many of us feel we've been knocked off balance as regular routines are disrupted, and many of us will be anxious. So let's pray for the Lord's help to receive and depend on his unchanging word to us. Do not worry. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the same yesterday, today and forever. Though so much has changed in recent days, you have not. And so, as David prayed in Psalm 40, do not withhold your mercy from me, O Lord. May your love and your truth always protect me. For troubles without number surround me. My heart fails within me. Be pleased, O Lord, to save me. O Lord, come quickly to help me. I can't tell you which page to turn to, but if you can have Matthew 6 from verses 25 to 34 open uh, on the Bible or on another screen, that would be great. I'm sure it's all quite strange tuning into me on the internet. Believe me, it's an odd feeling for me to speak to you like this. How I long for us all to be back together. Anyway, let's turn to this word from Jesus. He's the one speaking throughout these verses, which come from what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And this is his word of comfort to anxious disciples. I wonder if you counted the number of times he used the word worry in these verses. Six times, three of them in the command, do not worry. But it's not merely a command, like when someone snaps at us, oh, just pull yourself together. Now this is Jesus reasoning with us as his disciples, inviting us to put our trust in him and to take refuge in him so that we may know his peace. Come to me, he says later in this gospel, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So let's get to the passage. You'll notice that it begins, therefore, at the start of verse 25. All he says about worry is an application of what he has just been teaching. He's challenged his hearers, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's there in verse 21. What do you value most? God or the things that God has given you? It is a binary choice. The essence of sin is to choose the created things over the creator, to worship the gifts and not the giver. Paul paints a vivid picture of that in Romans 1, and we all do it by nature. But now Jesus is calling us to acknowledge that and to repent, to turn back to God. You can't serve two masters, so which will it be? Well, Jesus said, if you're going to seek God first, turning to him and trusting him, well, then, therefore, if you do that, you don't need to worry. And then he gives us seven reasons not to be anxious, seven applications of that command and call, do not worry. And I'm going to suggest seven daily activities where we could apply these in the coming days. Number one, in verse 25, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? This is an argument to use when you're looking in the shaving or dressing mirror in the morning. Do you really think that the God who has gone to all the trouble of giving you life and a body is now going to let you down in your daily provision? He made you a living being from dust. He designed you so carefully and laboured over you so lovingly fashioning you in that inward place before you even saw the light. Do you really think that, having given you life, he will now fail to give you all you need 
That's Jesus' argument. If a man buys himself a new car, does he refuse to put fuel into it? If God gives you, gives you earthly life, will he fail to sustain it? Life is more important than food. And if he has given you the one, you need to trust him for the other. It's very practical. Anxiety produces panic buying. Faith trusts in daily bread. Number two, verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? This is one to apply when you're standing at the kitchen sink, looking out the window at the birds feeding, or when you hear them chirping if you don't have that particular view. Look at the birds, Jesus says. When you see them eating, remember that my heavenly Father has just commanded that worm to stick its head out of the ground at precisely the right point so that the bird can have a good meal. My father did that, Jesus says. He cared for the bird so much that he fed it. Am I not much more valuable? Are you not much more valuable than the bird? Well, then trust him, for he made us in his image and loved us. Loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us. Don't think about the worm too much. No illustration is perfect or to be pressed too far. But when Jesus says this, he's teaching us that we are of an inestimable value to God. So look out the window. Remember how precious you are to your heavenly father. Number three, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Or it could equally well be translated, who of you by worrying could add a single span to his height? We have a spot on our landing where we record the height of all our family members. I'm going to try and remember this promise whenever I walk past that. Maybe you've got somewhere like that in your house as well. But you know, in our 19 years in Hartford, I've not grown any taller. My mark on the side of that bookcase is where it ever was. For 30-something years now, I've been five foot, six and three quarter inches. And yet over that time, I've worried about so many different things. I've always battled with anxiety, and you know what? It hasn't made me any taller. Here is a practical argument. Worry is just stupid. So reason with yourself, Jesus says. Don't be stupid. It doesn't do any good worrying. Number four, verses 28 to 30. Here's one for you when you're in the garden or going for a walk in the countryside while maintaining your two metres of social distancing, of course. Why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labour or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendour was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? That's a similar argument to the one in verse 25, but subtly different. In verse 25, the argument was this. If God has given you life on earth, you can trust him to give you the lesser things that are needful to sustain it. Food, soap, toilet rolls, and so on. Here the argument is that if God has given you eternal life, then how much more will he sustain you? Lilies and grass last just a day. We were remade in Christ to last forever. Paul applies it to us like this in Romans 8. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Number five, verses 31 and 32. Here's one to meditate on as you go to the supermarket this week and confront the empty shelves and your anxious neighbours. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Jesus says the way we go shopping must be different to our unbelieving neighbours. We don't need to run anxiously after all these things because we have a heavenly father who knows our practical needs and who we can trust to provide them. He's not just our father who loves us, but our heavenly, that is our almighty father, who is able perfectly to put his love into practice and to providentially supply all that we need. Earlier in this chapter, Jesus teaches us to turn that into prayer. Our Father in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. That would be a really good thing to pray in the car before you go into the shop this week. You see, the way we buy our groceries 
shows where our trust is. And why not? Newly and calmed, take the opportunity at the checkout this week to thank the staff for their work and patience. And so many of them have faced people whose anxiety has poured out in unpleasantness. Number six, verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. Here's a verse to start your day and to lead you in prayer. Could you pray this tomorrow morning, whatever you're doing, whatever anxieties you're facing? Lord, grant that this day I would seek your own kingdom before my interests. Grant that I would live by your kingdom's values, that is, with righteousness, whatever temptations and stresses would take me in another direction. You see, prayer is practical. Set your heart on heaven, your eyes on the Lord Jesus, your goal on obeying God, and you will discover again and again that God is no man's debtor. He will honour those who honour him. Seek the kingdom and righteousness of God, and not the quick fix, the easy path, the popular choice, the sensible option, the selfish urge. Put him first, and he will give you everything you need. That's a bold claim, so test it. There is another way. Anxiety fears that no one is in charge. Arrogance, foolish believes, we're in control. Faith says neither. Faith says, Lord, you're the king, and therefore I will trust you. And finally, number seven, number seven, another practical word of conclusion, verse 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is a good promise to remember when you're looking at your diary for the coming days or weeks, or if you're listening to the news, especially with those experts predicting the course of this virus over the weeks, months, or even years ahead. Today has enough troubles of its own, and we're promised today's mercies for today's anxieties. There'll be more troubles tomorrow, but probably not the ones you were expecting, so why waste emotional energy fixing things that haven't even happened? Could you have predicted the way the last days and weeks have unfolded? And even if you had been able, could you have done anything to change it? Well then, don't worry about tomorrow. Look to the Lord for daily bread, for daily needs, daily grace, for daily anxieties. That's the promise. So whether you're looking at yourself in the mirror first thing in the morning, or out of the window at the birds, or on a walk in the countryside, whether you're considering your height or your supermarket shopping, when you're praying or watching the news or planning your week, do not worry. If our treasure is in heaven and our hope is in the Lord Jesus, then let us renew our repentance and set our eyes on him. And as by God's grace we do that, we will find that our Heavenly Father knows our needs and leads us from fretful anxiety over them to the shalom, the deep peace of a confident faith. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Amen.